Welcome everyone to another Sunday night live here on the Living Theosophy YouTube channel. We are tiny. You will see us up here because we want to make sure our slides are in shot. Uh, welcome everyone. We have the president of the Blavatsky Lodge London returning once again with a warm welcome. We have the one and only Miss Petra Meyer. Hello, Petra. Hello. <laughs> Our tiny little talking heads. We have a very exciting show tonight. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about man, the eternal pilgrim. Uh, I also want to explain to those of you who've been watching this uh, throughout the COVID-19 lockdown, we were live on Sunday nights and we will still be live occasionally on Sunday nights, but we're going to take these interviews and they will be published throughout the week. So there are still things happening here on the Living Theosophy channel and we want to thank you for being here. Remember all comments, we try to answer those. I will place links in the, in the description so you can access free theosophical texts. I also want to thank the London Theosophical Headquarters out of um, London, England, the TSE, and invite you, if you wish to, a uh, volunteer. We're looking for volunteers at the Virtual Center for Theosophical Studies. That is theosophy.online. That is a new happening. So if you're, uh, these teachings resonate with you, um, we're looking for your help if you'd like to get involved, as well as the European School of Theosophy. There's a lot of stuff happening online. These ancient teachings are coming into the modern world so they can be available to all. So tonight, without further ado, let me pass over the baton to the lovely Petra Meyer and let us begin Man the Eternal Pilgrim. Take it away, Petra. Yeah, thank you very much. And I would like to start with the famous German poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe who once said to Johannes Falk, another German poet and publisher of his time, I'm certain that I've been here as I am now a thousand of times before, and I hope to return a thousand times. When one reflects upon the eternity of the universe, one can conceive of no other destiny than that the monads or souls should eventually participate in the bliss of the gods as joyfully cooperating forces. The work of creation will be entrusted to them. Man is a dialogue between nature and God, or the essence of the universe. On other planets, this dialogue will doubtlessly be of a higher and profounder character. And in his poem, Singing of the Gods Over the Waters, he wrote, The human soul is like water. From the sky it comes, it rises to the sky, and back down to earth it must go again, eternally changing. But what is this conscious human soul that is eternally changing? It's not an easy question, because what we are looking for is actually that which is looking. As Dr. Amit Goswami, professor of nuclear physics from the University of Oregon, so perfectly expressed in his book, The Visionary Window, A Quantum Physicist's Guide to Enlightenment. Theosophy or the ancient divine wisdom tradition can throw a lot of light on this eternal question about the origin of human life and its purpose. Or the eternally changing soul Goethe is talking about. That which lives and thinks in man and survives that frame. The masterpiece of evolution is the eternal pilgrim the protein or ever-changing differentiation in space and time of the one absolute unknowable, says the secret doctrine. Pilgrim is the appellation given to our monad, the two in one, during its cycle of incarnation. It is the only immortal and eternal principle in us, being an indivisible part of the integral whole, the universal spirit from which it emanates, and into which it is reabsorbed at the end of the cycle. But a monad cannot even be called a spirit per se, since it is a ray, a breath, a spark of the absolute, having no relation with the conditioned and relative finiteness, and is unconscious on our plane. Besides the material which will be needed for its future human form, the monad requires first a spiritual model or prototype or an astral form to shape itself into and secondly an intelligent consciousness to guide its evolution and progress 
neither of which is possessed by the homogeneous monad or the spark of the absolute or by senseless though living matter. The atom of dust requires the soul of life to be breathed into him. The two middle principles, which are the sentient life of the irrational animal and the human soul, for the former is irrational without the latter. It is only when, from the potential androgyne, man has become separated into male and female, that he will be endowed with his consciousness, rational individual soul, manas, the principle or the intelligence of the Elohim in Hebrew literature. And who are these Elohim is a question asked in, Uni in uh, Isis Unveiled, but the humorized or deific powers of nature, the faithful manifested servants, the laws of him who is immutable law and harmony. Starting upon the long journey immaculate, descending more and more into sinful matter, and having connected himself with every atom in manifested space, the pilgrim, having struggled through and suffered in every form of life and being, is only at the bottom of the valley of matter and half through its cycle. When he has identified himself with collective humanity, says the secret doctrine, this he has made in his own image. In order to progress upwards and homewards, the potential God has now to ascend the very uphill path of the Golgotha of life. It is the martyrdom of self-conscious existence. Like Visvakarman, the personification of all the creative forces in Vedic philosophy, beyond the comprehension of uninitiated mortals, he has to sacrifice himself to himself in order to redeem all creatures, to resurrect from the many into the one life. Then he ascends into heaven indeed, where plunged into the incomprehensible absolute being of bliss of Paranirvana, he reigns unconditionally and whence he will redescend again in the coming, next coming. You were already told, says the Mahatma Kutumi to Mr. Sinnott, that the path to occult sciences has to be trodden laboriously and crossed at the danger of life, that every new step in it leading to the final goal is surrounded by pitfalls and cruel thorns, that the pilgrim who ventures upon it is made first to confront and conquer the thousand and one furies who keep watch over its adamantine or unbreakable gates and entrance. Fury is called doubt, skepticism, scorn, ridicule, envy, and finally temptation, especially the latter. And that he who would see beyond had to first destroy this living war, that he must be possessed of a heart and soul clad in steel and of an iron, never failing determination, and yet be meek and gentle, humble, and have shut out from his heart every human passion that leads to evil. Are you all this? Have you ever begun a course of training which would lead to it? Mahatma Kutumi asked Mr. Sinnott. Another great German poet, Friedrich von Schiller, who wrote the Order to Joy, which was adapted by Ludwig van Beethoven for its ninth choral symphony, put the goal in one of his songs at the end of our human evolution into these remarkable words. No one should equal another, but everyone should equal the most high. How can that be done? Everyone should become perfected within himself. The knowledge about death and rebirth or cycles of evolution were in their essence known and part of every religion, philosophy, science, psychology, art and literature as Joseph Heed and Sylvia Cranston very scholarly demonstrate in their book, Reincarnation, The Phoenix Fire of Mystery. Very thought-provoking and beautiful is a passage from Philosophy of History by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, one of the most influential German philosophers of the 19th century, 
from whose writings Madame Blavatsky quotes a great deal in The Secret Doctrine, as well as in her collected writings. In this book, he says that a myth more generally known is that of a phoenix spirit consuming the envelope of existence does not nearly pass into another envelope or rise rejuvenescent from the ashes of its previous form. It comes forth exalted, glorified, a purer spirit. It certainly makes war upon itself, consumes it on the, its own existence. But in this very destruction, it works up that existence into a new form. And each successive phase becomes in its turn a material, working on which it exalts itself to a new grade. This reminds us of a passage in the voice of the silence where it is said, out of the furnace of man's life and its black smoke, winged flames arise, flames purified that soaring onward weave in the end the fabric glorified of the three vestures of the past. Reports about reincarnation are very well investigated nowadays, especially when they are coming from children which often could be traced back and confirmed by data they had given, as we have heard before. But I have chosen an interesting example from Dr. Eben Alexander, an American neurosurgeon who has worked at Harvard and several other medical schools and hospitals, and is a member of the American Board of Neurological Surgery and the American College of Surgeons. In 2008, he was very suddenly collapsed with a potential fatal form of bacterial meningitis and was in a coma for about a week with just 2% chance of survival. But he gained consciousness again against all the odds and the amazement of his medical colleagues who looked after him. During the 12 years that have elapsed since then, he has written several books about his near-death experience and has shared many forums on this subject with these people who had similar experiences. As a neurosurgeon, he had heard many reports from his patients of what they experienced when unconscious during an operation, but he always dismissed them as fantasies of the brain until it happened to himself. After reading Dr. Alexander's book, Proof of Heaven, the Dalai Lama invited him to join him for a public discussion about modern scientific views on reincarnation, where he could speak about his own experience. Dr. Alexander agrees with Tyler de Chardin, a French idealist philosopher, that progressive growth of consciousness itself is ultimately the purpose of our existence and that each of us plays a crucial role in this process. We return repeatedly through multiple lifetimes over vast cycles of time to participate in this shared endeavor. Reincarnation is a process of education for all beings in the grander evolution of consciousness, he says. This apparently standard procedure was part of the lesson that he learned in his coma journey. Reincarnation was presented in the core realm as part of the very fabric of all existence, not as some blind mechanistic wheel, but a process that is more directly related to our soul's purpose of existence and transformation. That reincarnation was the best way to reconcile the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent and infinitely loving deity he encountered with all the suffering of innocent beings allowed in our world, especially children and animals. The secret doctrine or the divine ancient wisdom tradition confirms the absolute universality of the law of periodicity, of flux and reflux, ebb and flow, which physical science has observed and recorded in all departments of nature. An alternation such as that of day and night, life and death, sleeping and waking, is a fact so common, so perfectly universal and without exception, that it is easy to comprehend it as one of the absolute fundamental laws of the universe, including the evolution of us humans. When I did my research some decades ago into the forgotten early teachings of Christianity, 
a culture in which most of us grew up, I discovered simultaneously that Jesus and the Brotherhood of the Essenes, from whose center he emerged, were not only strict vegetarians, but taught reincarnations as well. I've mentioned the Essenes in other presentations before, but here is some more information. Mm -hmm. Why are these things suppressed in Christianity and the canonical version of the Bible? But the Essenes are not even mentioned. Although they existed in significant numbers in Judea together with the Pharisees and Sadducees, I found some very interesting answers. Bernard Zimmermann was a son of a Swiss watchmaker. He studied pedagogy and became very inspired by great world reformers like Mahatma Gandhi, as well as by Eastern philosophies, including the writings of Madame Blavatsky. He finally lectured at universities and governments worldwide on subjects like biological agriculture, equality, anti-atom bombs, free economy, etc. In 1945, he was awarded an honorary PhD from the University of Toronto. And in 1953, an honorary professorship from the university in Tokyo. His book, To Free Shores, my translation, a record of his world travels, which he sent to me with his signature forced shortly before his death, is still one of my treasures. Mm -hmm. In his book, Heliant, Gospel of the Perfect Life, Zimmermann published extracts from the Gospel of Peace of Jesus Christ by his disciple John, which was edited in 1937 by Edmond Bordeaux Cicli, a doctor of philology from the Sorbonne in Paris and who became professor of philosophy and experimental psychology at the University of Cluny in Romania. Czekely had the rare opportunity in the early 1920s to do some research in the library of the Vatican, where he discovered an old Aramaic manuscript called the Gospel of Peace of Jesus Christ by his disciple John. Some years later, he found a verbatim translation of this text in a Slavonic language, in the Royal Library of the Kings of Habsburg in Austria. Zimmermann's book also contains extracts from the Gospel of the Holy Twelve of the Perfect Life of Jesus Christ, translated and published by the English priest and Reverend G.J. Ausley, born in 1835 in Lisbon, educated at the University of Dublin, ordained as a priest in 1861, who became a vegetarian refused alcohol and tobacco, most probably due to the initial teachings of Jesus and his apostles, which he had come across. Ausley died in 1906. In the preface of the first edition in 1902, Ausley wrote that the gospel in question was preserved in a Buddhist monastery in Tibet, where it was formerly hidden from the corruption by one of the Essene brotherhoods and that this Aramaic text was now translated for the first time into the English language by him. Very interesting narratives about reincarnation can be found in these old scriptures. One day it was said when Jesus was approaching a village, he stumbled upon a very hungry stray kitten. He took it into his arms and carried it into the village where he gave it food and drink and left it with a widow named Lorenza who promised to care for it from now on. People were very surprised about his behavior. and They said that this man even cared for the animals as if they were his brothers and sisters. And Jesus told them that the animals are our brothers and sisters in the great economy of life, sharing the same breath with us. And whosoever takes care of the smallest and gives them what they need, does it to him speaking of course from his higher self or logoic or christ consciousness who allows them to suffer shall reap the same consequences because as we have done in this life so it will be done to us in the next life when jesus was asked what he could teach about life he answered blessed are the ones who went through many experiences because they will become accomplished through suffering they will be like the angels in the heavens. They will never die or be born again because death and birth have lost their stronghold over them. All creatures emerge from the invisible and they will return to, to the invisible until they are cleansed. 
the body which you put into the grave or which is consumed by flames is not the body that will be. Because the ones who come will receive other bodies, although their own. And what they have sown in one life, they shall reap in another life. What was the reason for suppressing these fundamental teachings of every true religion and philosophy in Christianity? By the time of Constantine's reign, from 306 to 337, many diverse Christian groups and sects with their numerous circulating scriptures had established themselves after Jesus was gone. And Constantine demanded a unified and official credo from all their representatives as a general rule at the First Council of Nicaea in 325. It was a precondition for declaring Christianity a state religion. Constantine was quite influential and intended the council himself, but he was very much a man of the world. It was said, enjoying alcohol, meat, and beautiful women. Any form of asceticism did not find his approval. Vegetarianism and abstinence had no chance under his rule. The teachings of reincarnation where people have to accept total self-responsibility had no chance either. Origen, for example, who died in 254, still strongly believed in reincarnation, but his teachings were finally declared a heresy in 553. Many of the early Christian communities were, of course, horrified when they saw what was done to the Holy Scriptures. Some fled, hiding them in faraway monasteries, and samples of them have come to light over the centuries. As a quote by Buddha rightly says, three things cannot long be hidden, the sun, the moon, and the tooth. The saints did not believe, nor did they describe an anthropomorphic God. Their book of creation starts without beginning, the law creates thought and life. It is present tense instead of past tense, an ongoing process. God is always mentioned with the word law. It is behind all manifestation of life, material or immaterial. It is our teacher in all of nature, if we have eyes to see. We punish ourselves and we deviate from it. Creation, theosophy would call it emanation or materialization, is continuous and eternal, is permanently active in human consciousness as well as the material universe. It is a cosmic ocean of life made up of the totality of all living beings on all the life-containing planets in cosmic space. There is no distinction between organic or inorganic matter. Everything is alive. This could not be more theosophical. Mm -hmm. Besides the cosmic ocean of life, there is a cosmic ocean of thought or ideation regarded as a cosmic function and not restricted to our planet or man living upon it. The solidarity between all forms of life. Things are not finished and complete, but connected in a permanent dynamic activity, a reality that moves and lives. There is no static point in either nature nor man. Everything moves and evolves. But behind the totality of the laws of life of the universe, was a supreme power. The ocean of thought is its vehicle to which every enlightened being contributes. Where did this wisdom of the Essenes come from? As I have told, talked about in previous presentation, Madame Blavatsky tells us in Isis, Isis Unveiled that the Essenes were the converts of Buddhist monasteries, mon missionaries, who had overrun Egypt, Greece, and even Judea at one time since the reign of Azoka, who reigned almost over all of India in the third century BC. And while it is evidently to the Essenes that belonged the honor of having had the Nazarene reformer, Jesus was found disagreeing with his early teachers on several questions and formal observances. The motive of Jesus was evidently like that of Gautama Buddha to benefit humanity at large by producing a religious reform which should give it a religion of pure ethics, the true knowledge of God or the divine and nature, having remained until then solely in the hands of the esoteric sects and their adepts. 
What is the origin of this esoteric, occult, or divine wisdom with the Alexandrian philosopher Ammonio Saccas and his disciples called Theosophy? The key instrument for the discovery of this divine wisdom seems to be the hidden sound inherent in cosmos or the music of the spheres and in human language, especially Sanskrit. This is also symbolized by the Greek term logos, which was with every nation and people the manifested deity or the effect of a cause which is ever concealed. Thus speech is the logos of thought and translated by verbum or word in its metaphysical sense. It also symbolizes reason etymologically. Creative speech or verb verbum is the seminal principle scattered throughout the universe. The divine resonance is only the outbreathing of the first sound of Aum, the power which stirs up and animates the particles of the universe. The vibration sweeps along, touching with its swift wings simultaneously the whole universe and the germ that dwells in darkness, the darkness that breathes, moves over the slumbering waters of life. In Sanskrit, this supersensual spiritual essence, which pervades all space, is called Akasha, from which the first logos or expressed thought radiates. This is why it is stated in the Puranas, a collection of ancient symbols and writings, that Akasha has but one attribute, and that is sound. Sanskrit, meaning perfected or refined, is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, of all attested human languages. It belongs to the Indo-Aryan branch of the Indo-European family. The oldest form of Sanskrit is Vedic Sanskrit that dates back to the second millennium BC and which is paramount in the world's oldest religion, Hinduism. Sanskrit is the mother of most living languages. In Sanskrit language, letters are continually arranged in the sacred olas or containers or symbols so that they may become musical notes. For the whole Sanskrit alphabet and the Vedas, from the first word to the last, are musical notations reduced to writing. The two are inseparable. As Homer distinguished between the language of the gods and the language of men, so did the Hindus. The Devanagari, the Sanskrit characters, are the speech of the gods or the divine. And Sanskrit is a divine language or expression. What then does the sound of the spheres tell us in its most accomplished vehicle? the Sanskrit language about the origin, purpose, and destiny of us human beings. According to esoteric philosophy, everything in nature unfolds on a sevenfold scale, including humans, and has to pass through a gamut of seven stages of density. I say gamut advisably, said the Mahatma Kutumi, since the diatonic scale of music best affords an illustration of the perpetual rhythmic motion of the descending and ascending cycle of Svabhavat, a Buddhist term for the matrix of the universe, graduated as it is by tones and semitones. Frank Wilczek, Nobel Prize laureate and professor of physics at the Massachusetts Institute for Technology confirms in his book, A Beautiful Question, Finding Nature's Deep Design. Indeed, ordinary matter is built up from atoms that are in a rich and precise sense, tiny musical instruments. In the interplay with light, they realize the mathematical music of the spheres that surpass the visions of Pythagoras, Plato, and Kepler. In molecules and ordered materials, these atomic instruments play together as harmonious ensembles and synchronized orchestras. And again, he says, from the heart of matter music, there is no logical reason to expect that the math mathematics developed to understand music should have anything to do with atomic physics. Yet the same concept and equations turn out to govern both domains. Atoms are musical instruments, and the light they emit makes their tones visible. 
atoms emerge from the law and they emerge as beautiful objects. In her collected writings, Madame Blavatsky confirms this statement. As every atom in every object of nature, animate or inanimate, sings its own keynote and produces its own sound and has its own color and number, so every man, flower, tree, every celestial body is a play and interplay of sounds, both loud and faint, interblending in a marvelous symphony, as well as being beautiful, intermingling and flashing or silly or scintillating color, said HPB already 130 years ago. And Buddha says, you have to get rid entirely of all the subjects of impermanence composing the body. The permanent never merges with the impermanent, although the two are one. But it is only when all, all outward appearances are gone that there is left that one principle of life which exists independently of all external phenomena. It is a fire that burns in the eternal light and the fuel is expended and the flame is extinguished for that fire is neither in the flame nor in the fuel nor yet inside either of the two but beneath and everywhere. Neither Atma nor Buddha were ever within man, says the Mahatma Kutumi. It floated and overshadowed, so to say, the extreme parts of, human head, of the human head in Hindu sacred books, it is said that that which undergoes periodical incarnation is the Sutratma, which literally means threat soul. It is a synonym of the reincarnating ego, manas conjoined with buddhi, which absorbs the manasic recollection of all our preceding lives. It is so called because like the pearls on a thread, so is the long series of human lives strung together on that one thread. In some Upanishads, these recurrent rebirths are linked to the life of a mortal which oscillates periodically between sleep and waking. The personality is mortal according to esoteric teachings. It is a distorted reflection through a physical basis of the true manasic or mind self. It is just an instrument for harvesting experience for the buddhi manas or human monad saturating it with the aroma of consciously acquired experiences. The brain cell is real while it lasts, weaving its karma as a responsible entity. Esoterically explained, it is the consciousness in that lower portion of manas or mind, which is correlated with the physical brain. Very interesting and promising research into consciousness and reincarnation has also emerged from modern science. In the 1990s, Stuart Hamarov, professor of anesthesiology of the University of Arizona, teamed up with Sir Roger Penrose, professor of mathematics at Oxford University, trying to solve in a united effort as far as possible the mystery of consciousness, how it comes about and what its transmitters are. We all know what it is like to be conscious, to have awareness, but what is this conscious mind? How can the subjective nature of our phenomenal experiences of our inner life be explained in scientific terms, they asked themselves. Together they developed a theory which is called orchestrated objective reduction. The physical medium for consciousness to occur in the brain seems to be microtubules, the largest filaments within the cell structure and the brain neurons. Penrose and Hammerov proposed that aspects of quantum theory, like the phenomenon of wave function self-collapse, are essential for, for consciousness to occur. The particular characteristics of microtubules suitable for some quantum effects include their crystal-like lattice structure. They are hollow tubes around which their subunits, called tubulins, or globular proteins are symmetrically arranged, that they cooperate in that they are co cooperatively interact, having the same frequency as ultrasound. They can be assembled and disassembled as required by the cell. Not only can they connect with the brain as a kind of quantum computer, but also to the universe itself. 
monitoring the brain waves of dying persons by using an EEG or an electroencephalogram showed amazing results. About 80 to 100 megahertz is our usual scale of consciousness, 40 to 60 when under anesthetics. Lower frequencies are a sign of brain damage. When the heartbeat of a dying person stops, the brain waves drop to zero. But then something extraordinary happens. Suddenly an absolute burst of activity up to 90 megahertz appears in the neurons of the brain again for about 90 seconds to 20 minutes. Even with patients who are brain dead as well as animals, says Professor Hamorov. One could say that death seems to be most, the most awake moment, which a scientist interpreted as the soul leaving the body. And the person experiences all the stages of his or her life like in a film, as reported from near-death experiences. This led to the argument for an eternal soul. Since the soul as an individualized unit of the very fabric of the universe itself, it acts as a quantum container of stored information of a person's life experiences and can exist outside the body or, with other words, survive it in a kind of entangled quantum soul with all the necessary ingredients of accumulated experiences and latent possibilities for further evolution. And since it is able to attach itself after an out-of-body experience to the existing body once more, why should it not be able to attach itself to a new body in form of a reincarnation in an evolutionary process of optimizing its conscious awareness for its spiritual destiny, say the scientists. There was another remarkable scientist I came across in the 1990s who had done extensive research into consciousness and the human aura, discovering previous lives. Her name was Dr. Valerie Hunt, a professor of physiological sciences at the University of Los Angeles who died in 2014 at the age of 97. She was challenged by graduate students in the 1970s to study consciousness, even ancient literature, because they were of strong opinion that the true function of a university was to expand frontiers of knowledge, designing new directions. This became the starting point of a serious investigation into the mind, consciousness and the human aura, which is today called the bioelectric magnetic energy field. How does this energy field around us come about? What is it made of? What is its function? And what are its different aspects? The first equipment that was used in Professor Hunt's laboratory to measure the energies of the human body was a telemetry instrument, especially built for them by a NASA engineer who had already developed a telemetry system for astronauts used to send their vital physiological recordings of muscle and heart activities from the moon to the earth during the first manned space trip. The signals are broadcasted by FM radio frequencies from a battery operated radio transmitter and amplifier attached to the person's belt. It was already known that stimulated brain, heart and muscle cells create electrical energy which can be recorded. But using the telemetry instrument, even the auric field of a person appeared. It is smaller in amplitude, but higher in frequencies, which could later be associated with mind phenomena and human consciousness as well, when more sophisticated computer software was developed, a biofield monitor. This monitor showed that the energy field of each individual is unique, changing with emotions and consciousness. It selectively transacts with other outside fields of information, altering raw stimuli to meet its own needs. Every information must pass through this energy field before reaching the nervous system. In a quantum concept of vibration, the frequencies can be visualized by different colors and it has its own integrity. The entire scientists came to the conclusion that also the mind is an energy field phenomenon, having its seed in the aura. Before brain waves were activated, the field already responded, although the person experienced no conscious sensation. 
experiments with guest persons in a sound sterile room showed that people felt strange sensory apparitions and lost all sense of time. Their consciousness altered so rapidly that they were not able to operate instruments. When the electrical aspect of the room was withdrawn, the auric fields became randomly disorganized, scattered and incoherent. Energy jumped between people and their chakras or energy centers. Their body responded as though they were being threatened. When magnetism was decreased, gross incoordination occurred where people could not balance their bodies anymore. Other experiments showed that reflexes for material reality, like bodily or personal states, are recorded in and recovered from the brain. Other impressions, such as experienced knowing, higher information, transcendental ideas, insight about ultimate sources of reality and creativity in its poorest form, are properties of the higher mind, outside the domain of material reality, yet interacting with them in an open system, because Professor Hunt and her team were able to measure them. The mind can explore far beyond the closed circuit of the brain, and the brain may not even be aware of it. Grounded in a state of material reality, the energy field ranges from 350 to 600 cycles per second. In an altered state of consciousness, it exhibits a range of up to 200,000 cycles per second, containing information of previous lifehoods, which can be experienced. Professor Valerie Hunt formulated the difference between past life and lifehoods. When reading The Secret Doctrine by Madame Blavatsky, she came across the seven called false constitution of man for the first time. And that karmic law does not create anything, but that it adjusts everything. And that Madame Blavatsky positioned mystical bodies in the auric field, using the concept of bodies metaphorically. Professor Hunt explains that past lives just emphasize the physical existence of a life in a time-space construct. Life hoods, on the other hand, emphasize the soul which is part of the mind field, which exists now and has no time reference. It operates as a field. Lifehoods carry information about the soul's experience in a material body at any time in history. Since the soul is never destroyed, only the body which it enlivens, information from lifehoods are always now, a part of each new life. The concept of lifehood gives answers to what the soul experienced what patterns and beliefs the soul carries into each reincarnation, which are the memories of the soul's experiences. When awakened, past and present are experienced as now and not as a historical event. As the spectrum of human consciousness broadens, lifehood recalls come invariably with it. Professor Valerie Hunt became a mystic herself in later life and helped hundreds of people with her mind mastery meditations to open up experiences from previous lifehoods, from scientist colleagues, the most skeptical of all, to coma patients with amazing success. And she believes that reincarnation is a fourth dimension concept. In the key to theosophy, Madame Blavatsky tells us that during the last quarter of every hundred years, an attempt is made by the masters to help with the spiritual progress of humanity. That towards the close of each century, an outpouring of spirituality does take place. Someone or more persons have or will appear in the world as their agents, and that a greater or less amount of occult knowledge and teaching will be given out. This effect is very noticeable in the scientific community. So what significance does theosophy apply to the human aura? And in what way do the esoteric teachings corroborate Professor Hunt's finding? It starts with cosmogony. The expansion of the universal matrix or Mula Pakriti is a periodical shadow of the immaterial substance present in eternity thrown into the lap of maya or illusion. It is not an increase in size, but a change of condition. And the Mahatma Kutumi says it is spirit and life, 
without quality or quantity or form, but rather the space occupied in that ocean of spirit by the result of effects impressed down. This radiant force field is the underlying essence which contains everything in its potentiality. Every physical phenomena from subatomic particles to complete and complicated systems like planets or a human being is an emanation from this underlying electromagnetic energy field. Its radiation about animate and inanimate object was called throughout recorded human history aura. The auric envelope of a human being has seven layers just as cosmic space and our physical epi ep epidermis. It is a within on different planes of subjectivity, merging gradually into objectivity, says HPB. When the season of reproduction arrives, the sub-astral extrudes a miniature of itself from the egg of the surrounding aura. This germ grows and feeds on the aura until it becomes fully developed and it gradually separates from its parent, carrying with it its own sphere aura. And that now comes on to something very important. The auric egg, or the underlying energy field, is really the true manifested man, says Madame Blavatsky, because it is a manifestation of the vital life forces, which are flowing forth from the various foci of the reincarnation, reincarnating monad. So what is a monad? As we have heard before, a monad cannot be called a spirit per se, since it's a ray or a spark of the absolute, having no relation with the conditioned and relative finiteness. It is unconscious on our plane, needs a spiritual model or prototype to shape itself into, and an intelligent consciousness to guide its evolution. The astral form or manifested ideation of a human being is this spiritual prototype closing the monad. It happens in and is surrounded by its egg-shaped sphere of aura, and this aura is a true manifested man, says HPB. The astral form itself is the nucleus of this sphere, an ethereal agglomerate of life atoms in the auric egg <coughs> in combination with manas or mind and buddhi, its vehicle or soul which gradually assumes more or less a definite human outline. The aura is the origin of feeling of sympathy and antipathy. Every human being is surrounded by its own emotional and passional, as well as a psycho vital atmosphere, a portion of the lower layers of the auric egg. <clears throat> every human passion, every thought, and equally, and quality is indicated in the aura by corresponding colors and shades of colors. If these nerve vibrations are made intense enough and brought into vibratory relation with the astral element, the result is sound. When the ray point of the spiritual monad reaches its own intermediate sphere, it descends no further into matter, only its psychomagnetic ray having stronger affinities for the material world descends still further, awakening into activity the life atoms on each one of the planes between that of the re-embodying ego and the astrophysical matter of our Earth. Each part of the composite human constitution remains on its own plane, but extrudes its excess of life from itself into the next lower one, until finally the physical plane is reached where in only the tip of the ray, collecting into itself life atoms of this plane builds or forms the physical germinal cell. It would be quite wrong to suppose that the re-embodying ego itself is in the germinal cell or on a plane slightly less physical than ours. The process is an exact analogy of what occurs in the building of the globes of a planetary chain where the passage of excess of life takes place along and around the range of substances from cosmic plane to cosmic plane. The vital force is not enclosed in man, but radiates within and around him like the luminous sphere or aura, and it is made to act at a distance. 
It is the aura which, according to our mental and physical state of purity or impurity, opens eyes or for us vistas into other worlds or shuts us out altogether from anything but the three-dimensional world of matter. This is how important the role of the auric egg is in our human constitution. It is the field of all the different ranges of consciousness of the embodied man. And it is likewise the ethereal and astral and even spiritual substance or auric envelope out of which every one of the vehicles of the human entity is formed. Why then is not the recollection of past lives brought over by us from our last birth into the present birth? Because memory is included within the skandhas, which Professor Hans calls the fourth dimension, the Kama Rupa in theosophical terms. And the kandhas, skandhas having changed with a new existence, a memory, the record of that particular existence developed. Yet the record of a ref reflection of all the past life must survive. For when Prince Siddhartha became Buddha, the false sequence of his previous births were seen by him. And anyone who attains to the state of jnana or knowledge can thus retrospectively trace the line of his lives. This proves to you, says HBB, that while the undying qualities of the personality, such as love, goodness, charity, etc., attach themselves to the immortal ego, photographing on it, so to speak, a permanent image of the divine aspect of the man who was. His material skandhas, those which generate the most marked karmic effects, are as evanescent as a flash of lightning and cannot impress a new brain of the new personality. Yet their failing to do so impairs in no way the identity of the reincarnating ego. The memory of every personal life indeed is imperishably preserved in the mysterious records of each existence. And the immortal individual spiritual entity will one day be able to look back upon it. As upon one of the pages in the vast book of lives which he will by that time have compiled. I would like to close with an extract from Dr. Purutra's book, The Golden Precepts where he says, do not kill your personality. Do not annihilate your personality in the sense of wiping it out. You have brought it into being yourself. It is part of you, the emotional and psychical part of you, the evolutionary work of eons upon eons in the past. Raise the personality, cleanse it, train it, make it shapely and symmetrical to your will and to your thought. Discipline it, make it the temple of the living God so that it shall become a fit vehicle, a clean and pure channel for passing into the human consciousness, the ray of glory from the spiritual or divine consciousness. It is not the fall of the personality which frees the spiritual man. It is the raising of the personal into becoming spiritual, which is the work of evolution. It is the same thing that natural evolution in its long, slow, in its age long process is trying to accomplish, raising the lower up to become the higher. Be the holiest and noblest and purest that you can think of. Then you can forget your personality, which the body expresses. And by personality, I mean all the lower faculties of you, your whims and your little this and little that salvage your lower portions to nobler and superior uses. When the personal shall have become transfigured, when the personal shall be able to manifest more or less fully the sublime inflow from the God within you, your own inner spiritual divine splendor, then you will walk the earth like a human God and act like a God. For each one is a representation on earth of its own inner God. And you represent on the physical sphere as much of the divine essence streaming through your being as your evolution permits you to manifest. Therefore, begin even now to express the God within. You can. And the reward that comes from this is unspeakably grand and beautiful. Turn your gaze inward, not outward. 
This does not mean to be solely introspective and to abandon extrospection. That is not the idea. You must see in both directions, but do not seek for truth in any place except in the faculty which cognizes truth. Your innermost self, for it alone can cognize truth. Peace be with you. Oh my goodness, that was so beautiful. Oh, thank you so much, sweetheart. Let's, let's go ahead and close out so we can see your beautiful face. And I'll chop this part out. Oh my goodness. Hang on. That was absolutely fantastic. And I cannot believe that that much information was in the hour. I highly recommend if you've watched this far, do go back and revisit those very well thought out, researched uh, quotes. You had the collected writings in there, Isis Unveiled. You had, you had uh, the Secret Doctrine. You had everything in there, Petra. That was fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I mean, it covered what from Evan Alexander, the reincarnation, you, you talked about, there's so many things there I want to be able to ask you about, but what I would like to do is also go back and revisit that, the auric egg, and um, understanding uh, that Blavatsky is talking about the, the auric egg actually being the manifested man. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been a student of theosophy for over 10 years, I did not know that. Yeah, that is very uh, important. And even Alexander is uh, very well known in America. And uh, Pablo Zender had him also um, giving lectures at the Theosophical Society. So he's um, very well appreciated <laughs> in America. He's not that well known here, but uh, you well, know, as a scientist, as a neurosurgeon, <laughs> He finally had to experience for himself what he could not uh, understand from other people and that well, changed everybody's life. life. Because his word would be taken literally, he, was, he scoffed as well and thought it was an illusion of the brain until it happened to him. And he was able to write it down in terms that only neurosurgeons would know. But this has been happening since the beginning of time. So many of the things that you said in this particular hour Absolutely, such valuable information. This is called Man the Eternal Pilgrim. This is the journey of why and who and what and how and when we are. And if you're interested, if you hear this, I mean, I think I might, I might listen back to it and actually, I mean, you're able to flow through it. Your reading was brilliant, uh, but there's so much uh, research that goes into it and it really just glosses the surface. If you're interested to find out where these teachings come from, uh, you mentioned the Alexandrian philosophy Philosophers. You mentioned Plato and Pythagoras. You mentioned all of these uh, teachers that have come before Buddha and Christ and Krishna. Uh, this, this is the knowledge. This is the science and knowledge, not faith, but this is knowing. And that's what makes it different. So um, we were talking before you went live about the brilliance that is happening now in our year 2020 of science becoming mystics. Would you mind, would you mind sharing a little bit about that sentence that we were sharing together about what's happening today yeah i think it is because of quantum physics you know yes. there is no matter you know it's all energy and einstein said uh, matter is only a condensation in an energy field in an electromagnetic energy field and that is all and um, that it is music you know it's all vibration everything is vibration and it just condenses in um, like the Sanskrit uh, language, every word is like music. You have to pronounce it on the right frequency and that has a different effect on our auric field. <laughs> you, because- uh, Go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Uh, um, you know, um, this Professor Valerie Hunt, uh, she also uh, was asked if she could do, uh, do a documentary on television and she agreed and um, so um, a, a television team came and they obviously had uh, had a party the night before. They all smelled a bit of alcohol, alcohol and whatever. So all her instruments didn't work mm -hmm. while this um, television team was there. So she, asked, she thought something was wrong. She sent them all out. And then when they were out of the room, all the instruments worked again. Really? It was not that the uh, instruments were faulty, but the energy field didn't agree 
with the person they wanted to demonstrate with um, what the auric field is all about. And so it's they couldn't do, uh, yeah, they couldn't um, do a live documentary. They had, they had to go out and they had to use material which they had recorded previously. It was impossible to do a documentary with these um, people with their polluted auric field. So you see how sensitive um, that is, you know, all the information comes through that field and the brain is not even aware of it. Oh my God. And the way you explain that, there's so much to understand. You mentioned talking all the way down to this tiniest atom as a, as a musical instrument, the song of the spheres. We are told from the beginning of time that this is a vibration, a sound, a harmony, the mathematics of music. You explained it beautifully. And again, just touch the surface. It is so exciting. It is so exciting that this is coming out there. It is available. These teachings don't belong to anybody. They belong to all of us. They're free. And you can have access to them by accessing the, the links that I'll put down below in this video or just Google Theosophy. Uh, follow um, what Petra is doing at the Blavatsky Lodge. Anywhere, everywhere. If you are here, it is not by accident. Pay attention and listen, because this is the, well, this is everything. There's nothing that theosophy doesn't encapsulate or explain. And you did such a brilliant job. What we also have to remember is that what we are doing here is just exchanging information. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to work on it themselves. You know, yeah. it is not an intellectual exercise no. um, to get to the truth and wisdom and to uh, awaken our intuition. Only when we experience it within ourselves, then we know. Otherwise, it is just exchanging information, which is very important. Otherwise, we wouldn't hear about these things. But uh, then we have to work on it ourselves, and nobody can do that for us. Nobody can eat for us. Nobody can sleep for us. We have to do it ourselves. Very well said, because it could be just a metaphysical poem unless you put it into practice. If you yeah. begin to put these teachings into practice and you become them, you don't have to understand this mentally. Yeah. But if you're, if you're drawn to it and it seems to make sense, which it did with me, I know that the only thing I have control over is myself, my actions, my reactions, and sometimes my environment. If I put these into practice in my reaction with my friends, family, uh, finances, emotions, relationships, uh, physical, the way I interact with everyone else, this, this is the temple. This is where it takes place here inside of me and you inside of you. Theosophy is all about you, but it is what you do with it, what you do with it that makes yes. the difference. Mm -hmm. What a brilliant presentation, Petra. There is absolutely nothing I can oh, say because I love you. Very you. Much. I'm so it grateful is. for you. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and I look forward to having you back on. I know we'll be we'll be having uh, some of the Blavatsky Lodge, also the TSC out of London, England. Uh, we'll be doing some uh, presentations here on this platform. Living Theosophy is simply that. That's the one thing I would say if I was to die and I only had two words, I would say become Theosophy, become these teachings. So living Theosophy belongs to everyone. It isn't about one particular individual. These teachings are made available here for free. Listen to this again. Uh, listen to Petra's talk. Look up the quotes um, that she's she's put. Pick, pick up from wherever that is and maybe meditate on that. Think on that. If it touches you, listen. This quantum physics, science, religion, philosophy, this is the commonality of all of it. It is ancient. It is timeless. It is the... <laughs> textbook for humanity. Thank you, Petra Meyer. I yeah. love you so much. Oh, honey. thank I, you very much. I was I'm glad I could help. <laughs> oh, bless you. I just absolutely adore you. And um, everyone, uh, please leave comments. I will get to them as, as quickly as I possibly can. Do click the links down below and we will see you again soon here for more presentations. I know uh, if you want to give them a little taster tease about the cosmogenesis, I believe we were going to Yeah, the next one we could do is cosmogenesis, the rebirth of the universe. Yes, where it all began. Where did it all begin? All of that is answered in the teachings of Theosophy. It just depends on how deep you want to go and how much you want to put into it, because what you put into it is what you get out of it. Petra Meyer, I shall bid you farewell and do otherwise I'll talk to you all night long. I love you. And, Thank you very uh, much. Thank you very much.